Senior Lecturer at Bishop Grosseteste University, where I teach on the undergrad education programme and the MA in Children's Literature and Literacies. I'm also the UK LA representative for the East Midlands region, so if you're from my region, please say hi in the chat box. I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr Jeannie hill Bullman. Jeannie is an independent consultant who works closely with schools and academies and is highly experienced in using film in the classroom. She is also co-author of the UK Lane mini book, Film, Education, Literacy and Learning. In this webinar, Jeannie will be sharing her practical strategies, which are research based. Her PhD research established a progression framework for children's reading of film. We also have Navan with us who is monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions or comments, please do add them to the chat box. We will be answering your questions at the end of the conversation. Hello Jeannie, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation about how children read film. Can you give us a summary of what you will share with us in this webinar? Hello Emma, yes. So using film to raise attainment in writing isn't a new thing for many of us. Many have integrated film into viewing as well as filmmaking into their everyday practice in our primary curriculum. And the development of the literacy shared I suppose is, is testament to that. There's lots of work, research and practical work that's centred around the impact of film and what impact that can have on the quality of writing in the primary classroom, particularly led early on by documents and research such as QCA's More Than Words. And that effectively showed the impact on an increase in attainment in writing through such practices as viewing and analysing um, film in order to consider vocabulary development and so on and sentence structure. And it's almost impossible to separate the two, reading from writing, as one obviously informs the other. But the main purpose of today's conversation is to focus on how film can be integrated into the curriculum to impact positively on reading comprehension as well as the writing standards. And many of the practical strategies we will share with you are based on a four year PhD research project, which tracked a cohort of children throughout key stage two, moving from them being year threes to leaving the school as year sixes, looking at how film could be used as a text in its own right and as a means of developing reading comprehension of print texts as well. And although the research took place in key stage two, the outcomes could be equally applied to key stage one or key stage three. I chose key stage two as a group that I was working with because they had no experience of filming the curriculum previously. And also as being slightly older children, I thought there'd be less guesswork in interpreting the children's responses um, to the text as, we, as it was a research project. So, if you want to find out a little bit more, the thesis link is on the screen there and we'll be able to put that in the chat for you. And the um, reference to the books and the UK Lane mini book is there as well. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the links between film and reading comprehension first? Yeah, so we're familiar with how film can support children in their writing, but it's less common to think about the use of film to develop children's reading comprehension skills. And that's where this asset model approach um, becomes really purposeful. So whereas if we think about comprehension skills children use when they're reading written text, they deploy very similar skills when they're reading film. And there's a distinct difference, I suppose, between passively absorbing the content of the film and actively, actively engaged in meaning making. So rather than seeing the film and written text as opposites, or even seeing film as an activity that competes against an opportunity to read books, really it's looking at seeing how the two mediums, the two texts, are complementary and how the skills of reading film can support the skills of reading print and vice versa and looking at how the two intertwine and develop and support each other. 
so I suppose really, that's why you use the phrase reading film rather than watching, watching film. film. Yeah. And I think when children start to see the difference, that can make a big difference as well. Mm. And I think if we if we go to our sort of end point in the English national curriculum and look at what is expected of our year sixes by the end of year year sixes. And we know that national curriculum, when it was written, really, when they refer to text, they are referring to written word on the page. But actually, if we take text in its loosest form and think of the whole range of different texts, including film, anywhere where children can employ reading comprehension strategies, that's where I can look at that asset medal approach and look at how practicing with one medium can then support another. Looking at it from a film perspective and how the editor is trying to convey information and thoughts and questions and feelings to their viewer, I could almost take that and substitute the word film editor for author. And essentially we're looking at conveying the same skills as we're writing and then as a reader, how I'm inferring, how I'm deducing, how I'm predicting, how I may summarise a film and looking at how all those strategies can then be developed through film and applied to print text at the same time. And I think that links it quite nicely into the model that we often apply to looking at print based texts and thinking about the skills of reading as a reader and all the literal, the inference, deduction, prediction, summarising and so on. And then thinking about how once I've understood what a text is all about, I can go back and look at the impacts that that text is having on the reader and then answer the question, how is the author in a print text or filmmaker in a film text achieved what they've achieved? So the, the author or filmmaker, as you're sitting on the edge of your seat, you can't wait to see what happens next. It's really suspenseful. How has the author achieved that? Okay, how has the filmmaker achieved the same response in their reader? And then I can look at how those skills of uh, authorial techniques, filmmaker techniques, can work together and how as a filmmaker I'm doing this so now how as an author can I do the same and vice versa again back to that asset model approach and then looking at if we can analyze text reading as a writer then as a child I can start using some of those strategies in my writing as well which is where we come full circle to film to support writing too. I'm going to ask you how might a teacher go about introducing film as a text to read in this way rather than using a paper-based text? So the first thing I would ask the children to do is just look at the image in the same way we might just watch a film and passively absorb. So it's essentially just taking in what is in that image and then asking the children to consider when we look at that image, what do we know? What is a hard and fast fact that you couldn't argue with? It just is the case. And our children will pull things out like, um, it's snowing, there's a man or there's a person with a guitar case, there are posters on the wall and it's very much there's a this, there's a that, there's a other. And then we ask them to start thinking about, and they might go there anyway, but as a structure we then say, okay, so what do you think you know? And that's where we start saying things like, well, we think he's a musician and he's got a guitar in the case. We think it's night time because there are street lights. We think it's winter because there's snow on the floor and people are in winter clothes and they're huddled together. We think it's late at night and it looks like there's a man coming out of the pub in the corner there. Um, and the key thing there is drawing out the because element with children, because quite often they'll just give you the it's winter. And we start to sound a little bit like a stuck record going because because, but then it starts to stick. And the more I can get children in this context to give me what they think is the answer and back it up with evidence from the picture, you can see straight away what I'm trying to do there. So from the, what do I know? I'm practicing simple retrieval skills. There's this, there's that, there's the other. The, what do I think I know? Maybe deduction or inference and then backing it up with evidence from a text. But the real crucial point is making those skills explicit to the children. Because from their perspective, they could just think, I'm just looking at a picture and doing a nice activity. As soon as I say to them, look at that, brilliant, look, when you're answering what do I think you know, 
you're using the clues. You're thinking what you know about that kind of scene and bringing all that information to it. And then we can say, here's a short piece of text. Let's read it. What do you think you know? What do you say? What do you know? What do you think you know? And it's a means of rehearsing those strategies over and over again. And then take it into a very short film clip. Let's watch this film clip. Let's just watch and enjoy it. Then let's rewatch. Right, what do you know? Hard and fast fact. Don't give me any inference or deduction. But then in the next clip, what do you think you know? And why do you know it? All the time we're building the skills and making the difference between literal inference and deduction really explicit to the children. And another strategy there that I found really interesting was that bridge between answering these questions with a picture and taking it into text. Even if that text is at a level that the children can read and understand, some of them were still struggling to visualise. So as soon as we got that paragraph, rather than an image, there was a step in between for some. So they were really successful with the still images, really successful with the film, then we go to a paragraph that they understood the vocabulary, could decode, and they struggled. So there was a definite step in between to say, okay, let's read this paragraph. Now, before we start talking about it, if you were the illustrator or you were the filmmaker and you were turning this into a film, draw me that scene on a storyboard or as an illustration. Now, from your picture, what do you know? What do you think you know? And it was just that step of visualisation in between that was making the difference. So in your research, there's a clear progression then, because teachers might be well used to using questions like this when they're dealing with text. But from your research, there was a progression that suggested that if children were practised at doing it with a, <clears throat> with a still image, they still wouldn't necessarily apply that to the written word without that scaffold in between where they are asked to visualise what's happening in that paragraph. Yeah. I think there were two things. One thing that came out was that not all children, but some children couldn't do the visualisation and other children were just seeing this as some questions that they had to answer and really didn't understand the skill that they were developing and practising in order to then apply to another medium. And that's that asset model that we're fully aware of and we can look at that and go, oh, look, they're using deduction skills but they're not transferring it into print. Maybe they're not transferring it because we didn't make that skill explicit. And say, when you're doing that with a picture, do exactly the same thing when you're looking at text. And then the next step, once we've comprehended that picture, is to then say, what would you like to ask? Because this is, this, the link here is getting them to question what they're reading, whether that's in a visual form as a still or a moving image, and then question the author. So why did you make that vocabulary choice? Why did you withhold that information until the next page? Why did you structure that text in, in that way? And moving into those authorial techniques that would then move into filmmaker techniques and again back to that asset model approach. Mm. And that's where the second strategy of storyboarding became really powerful as a means of conveying to children the choices that a filmmaker makes in the same way that an author will make choices with regards to vocabulary choice, sentence structure, what he conceals and when he reveals, all those kinds of strategies then moving into film as well. So why did the filmmaker keep that, that hidden from you until a certain point? Why did they make the room look as dark and, and, and create that kind of atmosphere? The same kinds of questions I'd ask a film as I would ask a, a printed text. And getting children to read the storyboard for themselves or to analyse from a film what may go into that storyboard to have that impact on the reader. And I think that helps address that understanding of what impact on the reader actually means. Because I can look at a film and tell you how it makes me feel. Now, if I look at a text, how does it make me feel? How has the author achieved it? How has the filmmaker achieved it? And one of the ways we did that was by getting the children to look at some short film clips and very short film clips, and then do the, what do you think happens next? Then convey the, what do you think happens next? in the context of a storyboard. This year three children had no experience, very little experience of using film at this point. So we watched the film, we basically said, what do you think happens next? If you were the filmmaker, how would you show what you want to happen next in the storyboard? The clip comes from Teachers TV. Uh, they are still available online. 
but um, we can put that in the chat function yeah. and put a link to them as well if they're useful. Just one more little thing and then we'll have a nice cup of tea. Mr. Henry, how are you? Very well, dear lady. And yourself? Can't complain. I see you have Elizabeth with you today. Yes. Oh, the glitters is not gold. If there's anything we can do to help... You're very kind. Just lift the lid. No, no, dear child, don't open the box. Come on, Elizabeth. The lid. Okay, so they were a, a teacher's resource that um, were introduced as a means of, of giving children a story starter and then the intention was really now you go away and write the rest of the story but I wanted them to do it in the, the storyboard form. So Molly who was um, an age related on track leaving Key Stage 1 reader um, basically this was her outcome and she was a, a little girl who was very into fairies and unicorns and everything was lovely in Molly's world and everything she did always ended with a happily ever after even as year six it was a happily ever after at the end and really didn't like it if things were left on a cliffhanger and left unresolved um, but essentially in her storyboard even though we hadn't talked about filmmaking yet, it really showed intuitively how much children already knew from their preschool and their key stage one, all that viewing of film and television. She started with that long shot that showed us where the characters are. And basically she's got her characters walking into a castle and when they got to the castle, they found out that it was a dungeon. So this character had traveled through a portal in the box found themselves in this fairy tale land, beautiful castle, but it was a trick and they went through and they ended up in a dungeon. And our character from the film ended up behind bars. So we've got the kind of long shot to medium shot there that shows us the character and a little bit of her expression, but we can see that she's being jailed. And then there's a little bit of a hole in Molly's plot because she kind of sidesteps a little bit and finds that um, her mother at home finds a magic mirror. And somehow, not quite sure how, but she conveys this magic mirror through some thought process to Molly. And Molly then sees the magic mirror in her cell where we can see, she sees the mirror, a great big beaming smile, goes through the mirror and this ends up back at home uh, playing princesses with her mum and she ends with, I love you. So there are holes in her plot. But through that, she did show me where she needed a long shot, where she needed a medium, where she needed that close up to really show me that joy and that expression. And we've done no talk about this at all at this point. I just wanted to see what would come out. Three years later, as I tracked these children through four years, and we had started to talk a lot more about authorial choice and directorial choice in relation to light and sound and camera shot. And she now knew a few of the camera angles and camera shots. We watched a second film and asked her to do the same activity. This was the second film.
Ah, I've been expecting you. Okay, a little creepy there. I think mm. it's important to say as well that we didn't just watch the clip once. We watched it many times before we did anything with it. So we would just watch it and enjoy it before we put any focus in at all. And then we may watch with the view to thinking, okay, let's have a look, talk about what's going on. What do we know? And we may watch again. What do we think we know and why? And interestingly, in both those clips, certainly the first clip, when the children were year threes, they found they really struggled to get that first person viewpoint narration and an understanding of it because we never actually see the character. It's mm. just filmed through that character's eyes. So they really struggled to understand that really we are the character and the film is taking us into these places. Once they got it, it clicked into place, but it took some I getting I suppose there. that's quite unusual, isn't it? Most TV programmes yeah. and films they watch will have a main character that we're watching and we're yeah. the viewer, but, but they're quite unusual clips, aren't they? Yeah. And it's and even if you do, if in a film, I think you do go into the characters and see it through their eyes. There's an establishing shot that shows the characters where they are. And then you see things from their point of view. So that, that element was missing. But an interesting one to, to discuss with children. Um, and then we would just put the focus, OK, let's have a think about some prediction skills. Now we've watched it a few times and we think we know what's going on. And different children may have different ideas within the group. That's absolutely fine. Um, let's re-watch with a view to thinking where this may go next. Mm -hmm. And then the same task, you are a filmmaker, you've got to convey how you want these scenes to be filmed. And um, all the children, I've chosen Molly as this age-related on-track reader really, had so much more to say. And you could see her ideas around inference required from a reader of this film and the impact that she was trying to have on her viewer, reader, that we could then look at, okay, you want your reader to feel like that in a film, what strategies, techniques can we now use? And that's taking it into the writing again. But we can see her making references to other films. So within her first screen, she's got um, a mid shot still like in James Bond's Skyfall. Okay, she's a year five, she really shouldn't have been watching Skyfall, but maybe it was the clip from, but she's making that reference to other things she'd seen. This was completely independent as a research project. There was no suggestions from me. I just wanted to see what, what came out. And then she's got things like, as a viewer, you just see two tiny red eyes at the bottom of the screen and infer from that what might be watching. And then in the next scene, those two tiny, tiny red eyes suddenly blast out into the screen as this dangerous black wolf um, and the, the red eyes start to glow and flash. Then we get a shot of the girl that's just running off the screen and you don't see the girl, all you see is her hair flying behind because the shot is on the wolf getting closer and closer and closer as the, as the tension builds and she's, the wolf is getting closer to the hair on the girl. Then, in true Molly style, suddenly a beautiful Pegasus flies in. As she was reading a book about Pegasus at the time, so she was getting that into her story. And this beautiful Pegasus is all silver and magical and has pink and purple for beauty and silver for strength. Um, and sweeps Molly up and takes her to this um, fantasy world again, but we see what she was trying to convey here, even though we hadn't look at, looked at split screens, she'd seen it somewhere and she wanted to show that this fantasy world that this, this Pegasus was taking her to was going to be a safe place because the, the what was a, a haunted castle type thing as they flew towards it suddenly became this beautiful palace. As one dissolved, the other emerged. And again, in true Molly style, we ended up happily ever after. So again, still a few holes in that plot there, but it's telling me that her knowledge of impact on the reader of film was far more sophisticated now. And we could have those discussions about authorial techniques and directorial techniques in the same way. It's really interesting that she used that split screen without being told that was it, yeah. uh, something that she picked up on and it's really um, a useful way of introducing that term meanwhile isn't it and how in, yeah. in plots there are often things happening while one person's doing that think, meanwhile yeah. somebody did something else. Yeah, yeah absolutely in fact she had so much to say we had to add to it with post-its because it wouldn't fit on the storyboarding frame. 
I was going to ask you about that because in my experience of using storyboards um, with children in the past, they do find it very difficult to limit themselves to the number of boxes on the sheet. Yeah. Did you tell them that they had to? They, no. Obviously they could add by post-its, but they were only allowed to use those, those number of boxes. No, some children told the story in three or four boxes. Some went onto a separate storyboard. They were allowed free reign to take as many as they liked and yeah. as long or as short as they liked and add to it where they needed to. Um, the only thing I think I said about this one was to only use colour where it was significant because I wanted to see their understanding of things like the red eyes and the use of the silver and that rather than just colour the pictures to make it look pretty I wanted to see if there was any symbolism coming through there in their use of colour. Apart from that within this one it was free reign. So we could use storyboarding as an assessment tool could we to to see what children understand from film and could we link that to assessment of reading comprehension skills maybe looking yeah. at their cognitive language skills or yeah, I might you use that for assessment. Absolutely. And in fact, if we look at some screenshots from some other children uh, that, that show us a whole range of different things that they know about impact the filmmaker has linking to their comprehension, their, their understanding when they look at that shot, what they're trying to convey to the reader and what they're trying to convey in a literal inference and deduction and then looking at how am I conveying it. So here we can see this child using a, a kind of what we call a Dutch angle shot, almost as if it's taken from CCTV. So they're trying to say we're not in the room with this group of, of, of children in our shot, we're kind of looking at it from above and that wonky angle is really going to tell you that. Um, so then if I am looking at taking film into writing, we would look at how do you convey that in, in that sort of way. But here she's trying to say, right, through the type of shot I'm using, I'm almost distancing you from what's going on. And you're looking at, at this action as an outsider. And then here we've got uh, this idea of conceal and reveal that we might look at as a reading comprehension strategy. So how is a filmmaker concealed and revealed? And we did look pre pre uh, previously to this about different films that, that did that particularly well. So um, what do you know? What do you know? What do you think you know? What is the filmmaker do you think is hiding from you and why? And then what is revealed a little bit later and then the children start to use that in their own storyboards. I can see how that as a strategy is becoming more secure and dropping clues into the, the, the setting, the action, uh, without being explicit about them and then making them more meaningful a little bit later on and recognising clues in writing and then latching onto those clues and those fiction hooks a little bit later. I was just going to ask, it seems that that, that that progression and that understanding from the children is really clear from those but it's also very clear that they had some very explicit teaching going on. And I would imagine lots and lots of talk before and during and after these storyboards are created. And also within that, I think it's important to mention that it's, it's not a linear progression because it's not a case of I can do this and then I'll layer on and do that and then I'll do that because on paper it kind of looks that way, but actually much more of a spiral framework because as the complexity of the films increases, children move or maybe this is the first viewing so my responses will be very different from when I've seen it four or five times later and actually looking at how they move up and down that progression framework model depending on how complex the film is or how often they've seen it or how much chance they've had to talk about it then all those things will impact on moving around that spiral framework. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's in the same way that we might develop reading skills. So we might be teaching the same reading comprehension skill many, many times, but each time we teach it, we'll be using a text that's a little bit more complex or applying that skill to a different context. Yeah. So it's the same, isn't it? You might be using the same kind of skills, talking about the same kind of camera shots or, or looking at the same sort of strategy. But this time the film that we're using will be a bit more complex and there'll be a little bit more um, to talk about as we develop through that sort of spiral. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't stop. We might be doing deductive work with year one, two children and getting them to juice from text and look at clues with print text or film text. We don't stop doing that just because mm -hmm. they tick that box and got it on into key stage two and the, the medium becomes more complex. 
And that's where visually you can assume we move from, um, from A to B and we move from a literal reading to a deduction and inference and then into understanding authorial intent. Because I can't look at authorial intent until I've understood it, mm. whether I'm talking print or film, and then being able to make those links to wider interconnectivity between texts, but we'll move backwards and forwards. And the, the progression, although relates to assessment focuses because they were still in place when this research was done. So although the assessment focus doesn't exist anymore, obviously that factor of reading does, we still have literal, we still have inference and deduction, we just don't have that number attached to it anymore. And the whole framework looks at general comprehension. Then it looks at things like characterization, understanding of setting, understanding of plot, looking at genre. And then, so, so ones that really are employed in an asset model approach, as well as the ones that pertain purely to film. So we're valuing film as a text as well. And thinking about how children look at camera shot and their literal understanding linking then to building then to diff, um, deduction and inference, building onto that understanding then of a deliberate choice of camera shot and why the author had chosen, a uh, filmmaker had chosen that specific camera shot and then where else had we seen it and where else had it had similar impact and moving backwards and forwards the whole time around this spiral curriculum. Well, thank you, Jeannie, for that. It's absolutely fascinating. I could listen to you talk for many more hours about that and your research and the work that you've done with children. It's really interesting. But that's the end of, of this part of our conversation now. I'd like to thank you for joining us and thank those of you who are listening to joining us for the conversation. We hope you're going to stay with us now for the live chat. We're really looking forward to your questions and hearing about what you think about using film and how children read film. Um, and in particular, we'd like to think about the bullet points on this slide and add your ideas in the chat box about how you already use film and how you're considering extending your use of film in light of what you've heard today. So please put your questions in the chat and we're really looking forward to talking to you. Thank you. Well, while we wait for questions, Jeannie, hopefully lots of questions will come flooding in. I suspect people are just furiously making notes now of all those great ideas that they've, um, they've gained by listening to you. But while we wait for the questions to come in, the thing that really struck me about our conversation was how much those children progressed with their inference skills and with their prediction skills through the work that they'd done on reading film. Mm. And I think you've hit on a really important point there, Emma, in that it was... Uh, obviously this was a research project so the whole of the four years I was constantly just trying to not get too involved and see what comes out from the children um, from a researcher's point of view but at the same time being a practicing teacher you can't help but notice what a useful assessment for learning tools the same uh, research tools actually are because it's telling me what the children know what they don't know what they're a bit wobbly about I think one of the key things we found, and certainly through talking to my tutor at the time, Jackie Marsh from Sheffield University, um, after the second year and, well, predominantly after the first year, and a lot of the research was me just watching what the children were doing in the context of their classroom, as we moved through into the second year, I found it almost met a ceiling in that their they were their responses weren't getting deeper or more meaningful they were still using film they were still reading sometimes intuitively as we saw with molly's storyboards there as well um but it, it wasn't getting any deeper and it was through that discussion with my tutor that we kind of went well it, we can carry on doing this for the next two years and within our practice, if we carry on doing what we always do within a visual literacy classroom, this is what we'll get, which is great. 
However, what we decided to do was shift focus. And instead of me just watching as a, as a researcher, as an observer and looking at the children's responses, I shifted focus and kind of wrote a, a primary school film studies intervention program that really started to teach reading film um, and reading the skills of film. And that's where what you've hit on there with the inference really started to emerge as, as powerful. And I think one of the things that made their inference skills um, improve was because they understood what it was. It was that the visual was helping them to understand the difference between that simple retrieval literal response and it really highlighted for them, I think, that issue of um, a filmmakers, a directors or an author's deliberate choice. That these things didn't just happen. These things didn't emerge in the setting and that make up the mise-en-scene of the film by chance, unless or certainly professional films, everything that, that was there was there for a reason. Just like every word on the page that an author will give us is there for a reason. And it was that, that deliberate choice and that analysis of the filmmaker's choice that I think really impacted on their understanding of what is literal, what is inference and deduction, backing up their understanding with evidence from the text, whether that is print based or film based, those were the really powerful things that I think came out there. Mm -hmm. And listening to you talk then, I'm just thinking about the impact that that potentially has on obviously my research interest, which is reading for pleasure because the things you're talking about that kind of what we might call film talk will lead very naturally into I would hope book talk and once children are a little bit more aware of as you said how those words have appeared on the page it might generate a little bit more interest and a little bit more excitement about reading I don't suppose in your project you really looked at reading for pleasure as one of your indicators not specifically, but interestingly, as you say that, even though it was quite a while ago now, I, I remember times where children were bringing their book reading into our discussions about film and making those intertextual links. Uh, and we saw Molly's storyboard with the Pegasus, but it wasn't by chance that her reading book at the time was all about Pegasus. Um, so there were there was lots of their enjoyment from from reading print and from watching and reading other films as well that they they brought uh, into our discussions. So no, it wasn't a specific focus, and and Jackie kept reining me back in every time I tried to go off in another tangent because the tangents you could go off from this were massive. And I've had every intention of doing so ever since, but particularly things like the filmmaking, um, I kept wanting to go off down the well. What would we do? How would children's learning progress and their understanding deepen if it was? done alongside filmmaking projects because they were desperate to make films. And actually we did do some filmmaking, but just because the children wanted to, but really wasn't part of the research project because that would have been another PhD in itself. And if anyone really wants to do that, please do, because it, it would be fascinating. But um, what one of the things that, that really struck me with that, that we've already alluded to this morning, was that, that understanding of that first person narrative and it was interesting watching one of the children. And I don't think he was doing this for effect, but that very first film with the, the box that they opened that became a portal, I, I anticipated they would understand after a watch or two. And it wasn't until we watched it together and I said, I think, actually, you don't get this because of that first person and that absence of an establishing shot. But I didn't want to tell them because I wanted them to come up with it for themselves. And we watched and rewatched and rewatched. And in one of the rewatchers, one of the children actually tried to uh, picked up a pretend camera and was kind of pretending to film as he went along. And I thought, ha ha, he's getting it that he was seeing this now through the character's eyes. And that made me think, actually, your understanding of camera angle, deliberate choice of use of light or deliberate choice of use of sound when you're editing, if they're doing it for themselves, then surely that's got to have a positive impact on their understanding of, of what they're reading as well. Uh, but there just wasn't the scope within this project to do that. We have got quite a few questions coming through now, but I just wanted to link that to one of the comments that Katie made that they'd used that clip as a, as a writing yeah, task, I saw that. writing and, and the children found it difficult and they, you know, they just hadn't realised 
that step that it would take for the children to understand what was happening in the film. Yeah. So it's fascinating, isn't yeah. it? And neither had I until we started mm -hmm. to view it. And I thought, oh, I see what's going on here because you're not used to watching films mm -hmm. that are presented in that way. And also it strikes me how many times we might present children with film and text, actually written text on paper, and expect them to understand it straight away and not give them chance to rewatch over and over or reread over and over before we start bombarding them with questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before they've really had chance to visualize and, and get to grips with what's happening. But let's go to the questions because Sophie um, has asked, or well, some really, really good comments on there, Sophie, about how fascinating Jeannie's research is, which I absolutely agree with. Um, Sophie's used images in the past for Star Trek activities and so on, but then reverted straight to a written text for the main session. So she's interested in how. Um, how often you would use film as the main focus within a reading lesson and that sort of frequency, I suppose? Um, well, within the research project, it was film all the way because that's what it's about. Now, when I'm planning units of learning alongside teachers now, there's, there's no kind of structure, really. I'd be quite hesitant to, to get into a routine of we'll, we'll use film and then we'll go into write, uh, go into print text. Um, and it, it's really kind of starting at that end point of that unit and kind of going, well, what do I want out of this from a reading comprehension point of view and from a writing point of view? And then what do the children need? And then finding the right resources to do so. Um, so I couldn't say there's a 40%, 60% balance or, and it will vary according to what those outcomes are. There'll be some units I plan where I use very little film, even though I'm a huge advocate of using film, sometimes it's not the right tool for what I want the children to do and at other times I'll predominantly use film. So I couldn't say that there's a, a very definite frequency of percentage that I use. It's very much, well, what do I want the children to be able to do in two, three weeks time? And seeing film as one of the medium to 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 use in order to get them there. I, does that answer it, do you think? Well, it does. And I think it's, I think Kerry's led us on quite um, quite nicely into thinking about how this fits in with the curriculum and what you alluded to earlier on and certainly the way I've used film in the past is to look at the curriculum and wherever the curriculum says text to use a much broader understanding of what text is and the national curriculum talks about text as though the only text available to us to, to use in the classroom are paper-based text and I think as teachers we do tend to also assume that that means novels or fiction quite frequently so when we're reading the national curriculum we tend to read it through a lens of paper-based fictional text whereas I think you've switched you've switched that round a little bit and thinking about text in a much much broader way and maybe when you do that you can see that the national curriculum has lots of places where we can teach um, through film is that is that how you work yeah, Brown. that's that absolutely summarizes it. And I think as soon as we start being creative about that word text, and I fully understand when they wrote the national curriculum, they probably did mean print on a page. But if we interpret it in its widest sense, in that when I'm reading a, a wordless picture book, a picture book, a novel, a poem, a nonfiction, a film, animation, or whatever it might be, I'm employing reading strategies. Whether I am just watching and observing and that almost reading in the moment uh, of just getting understanding and information from it or whether I'm going back and um, employing some reading comprehension strategy of what do I know what do I think I know or I'm considering impact in order to go into authorial directorial techniques the skills are the same. I'm just employing them towards a different medium. And, and just coming back to something you mentioned earlier, I think sometimes, particularly with more able children, regardless of medium being used, I've been guilty in the past of jumping too quickly and just thinking, right, they'll be able to watch this and then we'll be able to do some inference from it or we'll get some prediction going. But they needed to just watch and absorb. And by doing so, by not skipping that very first step of reading in the moment, then, then they can think at a deeper level, but not necessarily a more accelerated one. You can't just jump straight to, OK, so how did that make you feel? How did the filmmaker do it? Because they haven't gone through those earlier stages first. Yeah. 
Yeah, and actually thinking about Kerry's comment about the curriculum juggernaut, we also have to bear in mind the Ofsted juggernaut. But again, if if schools are embracing that sense of, of what what Ofsted is saying about schools curriculum, which has to have intent and implementation, if our intention is that children develop better comprehension skills through inference, yeah. uh, through talk, through a range of variety of activities, then our implementation can be through introducing film and, as you say, through other uh, different types, text types as well, as long as we're very clear as a school that this is our intent and this is how we implement it, then there's absolutely no, um, there's no, there's no problem with that, is there? There shouldn't be, no, and I think one thing that it, we can make really explicit to, to us there is that I am teaching the comprehension skills we're not just practicing comprehension skills by here's a text, here's 10 questions, here's another text, here's another 10 questions. I'm making those skills explicit for the children so they are then transferable. So I'm teaching the skills, not just asking them to practice it over and over again. Um, and I think that's the thing that makes it powerful. And if Ofsted don't recognise that, then I need to point it out to them. I need some opportunity to, to, to get that inspector. They haven't got any Ofsted inspectors in the, in the room with us today. But to, get, to get that inspector to one side and say, look, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I'm teaching the strategy. And then they can transfer it. And I would say it's not all about film and then into text and never going back again, because we looked at that spiral framework it's backwards and forwards the whole time. Um, and what we're, when we're looking at authorial techniques and that buildup of suspense, what I can do is say, okay, let's take that bit of text. Now, if you were a filmmaker, how would you film it? So they're then employing what they know about, and the whole thing goes backwards and forwards both ways. And then it really clicks into place for them. Yeah. Fabulous. And we also had a question um, from somebody asking about whether there are specific groups of children, thinking particularly about those under attaining children or perhaps children who aren't yet confident or independent readers. Did you notice any difference for them? The, the, I can't see the question now, but the person seemed to think that this would have a bigger impact on perhaps your lower attaining children. Would that be the case? It was really interesting because we because it was a research project. I asked for I asked the teacher and the head teacher to select three, uh, there were nine children that we started with and three that were age related, three that we would use in terminology today, we would consider potential for greater depth readers mm -hmm. and three that were working below age related expectations. So all the way through the research project and in the book I refer to had the impact of the different strategies on different and the children that had different reading attainment. And there were two that really stood out. One was a little boy who came through below age-related expectations in year three. He was really struggling with his phonics. And it was, it was quite sad because he was starting to say, I don't read, I'm not a reader, I can't read. He had so much parental support. They shared books with him at home. They tried to keep the love of reading going. And yet when we used film, his, his literal inference deduction reading of film was is the responses he, he was giving me were very similar to that middle ability age related expectation children on track. And he was a real success story because this was in the days of levels and there was so much phonics intervention that went in and looking at synthetic teaching of phonics, but also and this is quite controversial, but what really started to work for him was once we they, they taught synthetic teaching of phonics so many times, they switched tack a little bit and maybe wouldn't say it was a phonics session, but they were working with onset and rhyme and syllable work with him, as well as synthetic phonics, and they got his phonics back on track so he could access written text himself. He left year six on track, age related, got a level four, and it hadn't damaged his, his love of reading and his perception of a reader because he was on that cusp in year three of going, no, reading's not for me. Mm -hmm. um, equally, there was a, a little boy in the group who um, he was an avid reader. He, did, he, he was one that parents had to um, take the books away from him because he was reading under the covers at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, he would read all the time and an amazing writer. In fact, he, um, he submitted a story to the uh, BBC 
500 words and got through to the final wow. um, didn't, didn't win um but got through to the so so you, you know it, it, sometimes they come along don't they these amazingly gifted writers and, and readers and there was a, a girl that worked in the kind of middle ability reading group on track happily trotting along she really gave him a run for his money when it came to interpreting and analyzing film and the discussions that they had at a much deeper level were amazing um, and it really showed me the use of film as an assessment tool but where we might have phonics that's a barrier or maybe a barrier is a written response to text but just getting the children to show those different skills of um, what we'd call content domains I suppose applied to film was a really really powerful tool. Yeah yeah um, and uh, the final question we have so far is, do you have any thoughts around how schools could link with filmmakers or the film mm. industry? How exciting to support the development of these approaches? Yeah, well, in the uh, UKLA mini book quite a long time ago now, I worked with a teacher of, again, a year three class. And um, we had an off timetable film week where we kind of, um, the, the, the class, at the end of the school year, they'd done lots of work on film. This is a different research, it wasn't a research project, this was a, a, a very small case study really, um, but is written about in the UKLA mini book. Mm. Uh, so the children, these year threes, had, had been um, using a lot of film in their curriculum throughout the year. And we went off timetable for a week. Week probably wasn't long enough in hindsight to turn the class into a, a film industry week. And they basically, they made a film, they made a trailer, they promoted the film, they did a whole load of maths around costing for the film. Uh, they looked at costumes, they um, promoted the film with the infant school. So much went on and it, it, it's, it's outlined in there, but, um, but the actual film industry, there's lots of work done with British Film Institute, and I would definitely recommend getting on board with Interfilm um, as a company for those opportunities um, that do so much more than, than film clubs. That's an important part of it, obviously. And their, um, their film week, taking children to the cinemas and, and all the activities that go on around that. But yeah, we did a lot of work um, with a local film company because we also put on an annual... Um, film event called The Laughters, uh, which was Lincolnshire's um, <laughs> kind of BAFTAs. But, uh, so we worked with local film industries to support with that as well. So it, I would say it's, def it's definitely a good idea to look about what is around locally that you can work with from that film industry perspective as well. Sounds really exciting. Mm. Um, and from that, I think Janine's asked an interesting question because our children um, often have lots of access to film. So what she's asking is when choosing films to read, is it best to choose film shorts that the children haven't seen before? Or is there merit to use films they haven't have already seen? And I suppose from my point of view, when I've used film with children, they tend to have really um, varied experiences of Disney films and what can be quite difficult is those plots and the characters in the Disney films can be quite complex and confusing um, and not always showing the sort of strategies that you want to use. So I always tend to use short films because <clears throat> they allow for much more re-watching. You know, if it's only a four minute clip, you can re-watch that many, many times and really focus in on those. But what have your experiences been around children having pre-knowledge, pre-experience yeah. of them? I think it's varied um, because it comes back to what do I want to get out of it and if I want to do some prediction then I would want the children to have no experience of that film. Now that's getting harder to find um, and harder to find when we, we want we don't want any of the children in our class or that group to have experienced that film so that's where I go to an educational resource like Literacy Shed Although I have found some children are going on Literacy Shed at home and just watching the films for fun because they quite like them. So what I started to do where I want to be sure that the children won't have any access to this previously to, to this unit, unit because I want to do some prediction with it is I can go to somewhere like Literacy Shed and 
look at some of the films there and the ones that I like or the ones that the children like and we'll make sure to make a note of the, the filmmaker's name then go on to YouTube type in the filmmaker's name and you'll get a whole host of others of a similar style or a similar feel that the children maybe haven't happened across. The other thing for prediction that, that went very wrong uh, with a, a teacher that I was working with was she was using a film from uh, the BFI, the British Film Institute, story shorts and starting stories, brilliant packages of DVDs, short films. Um, and she was using a film called Dangle. Some of you maybe know it. it's a very popular one. Yes. And um, what she did was we planned this whole two weeks and it started very much with just watching a little bit of film and then prediction and a little bit more and prediction. But it was one of those films that started, then it showed you the title and then it went on. And at the end of the first day, the children had had the first bit and the title. And then a significant number went home, Googled it to find out what would happen next, watched the film. The next morning they were full of it, they loved it, but there's the rest of the week's planning out of the window because there was no prediction work because they'd already gone and watched it. So hide the title. Um, I used a, a variety of short films and clips from longer films. Um, and sometimes it benefited where they did have an understanding of that film or that genre uh, beforehand particularly where I wasn't interested in doing prediction because they could talk about character development and things like that a lot more. So, so again, no rules. It really depends on what do I want the children to be able to do. Therefore, what type of film will do that for me? Fabulous. I'm being told by Navan that it's time for us to wrap up now, Jeannie. And I oh, it's flown. been talking for ages. It's flown. It's been absolutely fascinating. You have got such a wealth of knowledge and experience. So it's been a real privilege to spend the morning with you. Thank you very much. Oh, and for me too. It's been lovely to talk about it all again. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. You have got some great questions and really interesting um, comments, which I'm going to go back through and read after the session. And I just wish you all luck. I hope you're inspired to try using a little bit of film and maybe you could contact your region rep and let them know how you've found it and any other support that you need um, and see if we can get some more events like this going on so thank you very much all of you for joining us and thank you in particular to Jeannie for being so fabulous thank you oh thank you it's been a pleasure thank you Emma thank, thank you everyone you. for coming bye. bye everybody enjoy your weekends bye, bye.